It's good to be back. King Kong. Yes, indeed. Yeah. All day long. Let the haters hate. We're going to congratulate. Brothers and sisters, it's good to be back. Last time I was here with you all was five years ago. We was at a community center or a library. Can't remember. Some of you may have been there. It's been five long years, and one of the reasons for that five long years is because it was difficult to find a location to host the event. Although I speak a lot, and although I'm an educator, I'm not the boogeyman. School psychologist, I'm not the boogeyman, but as you might imagine, a lot of people take issue with my views and platforms on different things. And so they're often fearful to allow me to come in and speak. Nothing ever comes of it, but just the hype, the hype of the negativity that surrounds Dr. Umar is sometimes too much for some brothers and sisters to allow me to use their space. That's one of the reasons you rarely see me speak at a public school or a charter school, although I'm a principal in the school psychologist. And that is because my message some of which you're going to hear about today for all my parents who are here with the beautiful children. My message is one that exposes the misdeeds of the public school, the charter school, the parochial school, the independent school. But with all that being said, it doesn't really make a difference to me because I have to do the work regardless. A lot of people ask me, they say, Dr. Umar, what keeps you keeping on? through the sabotage, in the hate, in the slander, in the gossip. What keeps you keeping on? And I would answer that by saying, my self-belief that I was born to do this work. Some people come to black consciousness for a lot of different reasons. Some come because the white man pulled the chair out from under them and they fell on the floor. And so they embrace black consciousness as a reaction to being rejected by the white power structure. And these types of Negroes are dangerous because if you only came home because the white man rejected you, if he sends you another invitation, you might go back to him. Other brothers and sisters come to consciousness because their economic situation bellied out from under them. Others come to consciousness as a result of going through the stripes and struggles of being on the streets, which is fine. Others come to consciousness as a result of being around other conscious brothers and sisters. Nothing wrong with that either. But for me, I came to it as a child, fourth grade, Mead Elementary School, North Philadelphia, and I never left. So the degrees never changed me because ever since I was nine, I believe I was meant to play a role in the liberation of African people. And when I found out I was related to Frederick Douglass around the sixth grade, that solidified that for me. And when in the third grade, I decided to be a psychologist. So third grade psychologist, fourth and fifth black history class, sixth grade Frederick Douglass, so by the time I left elementary school, I knew what I would be doing with my life. That's my path. So money can't change me, degrees can't change me, whole teppers can't change me, haters can't change me. I'm here to stay, I'm real. Which is why I don't go around trying to prove that. I don't go around trying to prove that, Las Vegas, because I believe if I just do the work, you'll see it. I regularly get brothers and sisters who come up to me and say, Dr. Umar, I owe you an apology. I was one of those haters until you saved my child. I was one of those haters until you bought that school. And there's going to be others who are going to come with their apologies after the school opens. And that's OK, too, if you were not a public nuisance to the mission. But if you are a public nuisance to the mission, I'm going to have to enter your name in the Book of Negroes. And y'all know what the Book of Negroes is. That's a book that has all my haters in it. Every last one you can think of, all the YouTubians and everybody else. 
And they gonna come crawling up to the front of our school because it's not mine, it's ours. And they're going to come crawling up to the front of the school saying, Doc, I'm sorry. Can't come in, brother. Because even if you disagreed, you could have kept your mouth shut. You didn't have to sabotage and undermine. It's one thing to say, I don't trust Dr. Umar. It's one thing to say, I don't believe in Dr. Umar. It's one thing to say, I think he's spending all the money. And keep that to yourself as an opinion. But once you put it on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and once you make a thousand videos a week, you understand, at that point you became a public opposer to saving our children from the psychoacademic holocaust. And that we can't tolerate. So what is the psychoacademic holocaust black parent and black community? It's six stages that America created to destroy all masculine African children. The girls too, but mostly the boys. Stage one, miseducation. It is intentional, it is not an accident, it is on purpose. And I need you to understand that the miseducation of black children in Nevada is intentional. It doesn't happen because the father's not in the home. It doesn't happen because he's in jail. It doesn't happen because the mother's not married. It doesn't happen because he likes basketball. It doesn't happen because he listens to gangster rap. It happens because the American white power structure cannot let the black boy compete equitably with the white one. It's about preserving white privilege. And because the miseducation of our children is about preserving white privilege, the schools have to fail. I need some water, Sister Freedom. Gosh, the CIA didn't touch this water, right? <laughs> it's the city that killed Tupac. I gotta be careful. I gotta be careful. A mic, all right. Is that an agent device? <laughs> With flavor enhancing minerals. Yeah, that's the shit y'all put in Kali that do Muhammad drink too. <laughs> but I'm ready when you are. But brothers and sisters, The miseducation preserves the white privilege. I need you to get that. Which is to say, as long as we let our kids get educated by white folks or their curriculum, we'll never catch up. Because your enemy is never going to prepare you in the art of taking their power and domination away from you. That's never going to happen. So until we build our own schools for our own children, our babies will always be a step behind this. Protecting white privilege. That's why 90% of America's teachers are white women. The white woman plays a very important role in the destruction of black male masculinity because her job is to psychologically disarm the victim. The white woman's job is to psychologically disarm the black male child. To make him think she's an ally. They use her to do the same thing with adult black males. Charles Barkley's wife and Jalen Rose's wife and all these other ones. To psychologically disarm you and also economically neutralize you. Because a black millionaire with a white woman will never use those dollars for revolutionary purposes. The white woman is brilliant in her ability to make black males think she empathizes with you. That's her job. And the white male does the same thing with the black female. He gets inside the mind of the black woman and make you think he really cares about you. It's the same man that been raping your grandmother for four centuries, but all of a sudden, he cares about you. 
But you notice they only care up until a point. Because when that police officer shot Micaiah Bryant four times in the chest, the white man didn't show that compassion. He only shows it when he's in a one-on-one -on -one situation with you. If you notice, white folks never organize to save black folks. They only verbally empathize with black folks. And this is why Negroes love to come and tell Dr. Umar, I know some good white people who speak up against what happens to us. But can you show me some who do something about it? It's not the words, it's the actions. We get brainwashed because a white person will come here and give you two hours of white supremacy and say, I understand black folks, and then drive his privileged white ass back home to a gated community in the suburb, and if he sees anything black outside of his house at night, won't hesitate to dial 911 12 hours after he told you how much he loves black folks. White people are masters of mental manipulation, but let me not give them too much credit. Let me not give your oppressor too much credit because if you were not still in love with him, it would be difficult for him to manipulate you. It is your desire to be accepted by your oppressor that makes it difficult for you to do anything about the oppression. So let's get back to these six stages in the psychoacademic holocaust so they miseducate the black kids on purpose. The white woman's job, psychological disarmament. And then after they miseducate the black kids, they then come with the special education. Now, black parents, I'm a little angry at you guys. I've been looking at some of the Las Vegas special ed numbers, and they're very high for black children. You parents in here are screwing up by letting these white folks evaluate our children. Stop doing it. White people have no business evaluating black folks. You take your child to a white psychologist to solve problems that white people created. How does that happen? How does that work? The psychologist can't cure you or save you because the diagnosis is racism. You're angry, why? Because of racism. You went to jail, why? Because of a lack of opportunities, racism. You don't have a man in the house, why? Because America's war against black masculinity, racism. Is the psychologist gonna do anything about that? Hell no. In fact, psychology helped to create racism. It was the psychologist who invented segregation, who invented white genetic superiority, African inferiority. The word eugenics is a psychology concept. The word special ed is a psychology concept. They invented it. How the hell are they going to take it back? Special ed, invented by an act of US Congress, 1975. Public Law 94-142, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. The Education for All Handicapped Children Act. Why did they give a special ed in 75? Because of Brown versus Board in 54. That said you can't use race as a factor in the schools no more. So white folks lost their mind. And from 1954 to 1974, we saw the largest growth in independent private schools in American history. You know why? The minute they said they had to desegregate, white folks pulled their kids out and opened their own schools. The private school industry was a result of school desegregation. And then what you do is you go chase the white folks out to the suburbs and pay $15,000 a year for your child to become a master of Christopher Columbus, Helen Keller, and Anne Frank. And then when your son wants a white girl for the prom or your daughter wants blue contacts permanently, you call up Dr. Umar, what's wrong with my child? You, because you stuck them in a self-hate incubator. You stuck your child in a self-hate incubator for 12 years, 6 years, 4 years, 
They wonder why they came out wanting to be white. Because the purpose of education is to deify European culture and thought. The purpose of education is to deify European culture and thought. They don't teach our kids how to think. They teach them how to worship white people. Show me a school in Las Vegas that doesn't teach black kids how to worship white people. Even the Afrocentric schools are teaching them how to worship white people. You got a whole army of black teachers with dashikis on with a blind head full of weed. What the hell is that? And that's why at the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, ladies, gentlemen too, because I heard the brothers wear gold out here too in the head. I'm picking with you. You cannot work at that school with a weave or a perm or European hair color. We will not tolerate it. 100% unapologetically African Academy. Because before you can change anything else about the black child or mine, you have to change the way they think about themselves. Michelle Obama, Condoleezza Rice, these are good examples of black women, well-educated, successful according to European standards, a total failure by African cultural standards. Yeah. If you don't love yourself, you have been miseducated. I don't care how much money you make. Kamala Harris got on TV last week and said America is in a racist country. And this is who y'all broke y'all necks in November to go vote. You were standing up in a hot Nevada sun, 300 degrees. We want Senator Kamala. Throat was dry, funky, deodorant, and ran down. I'm exercising my right to vote. Negroes love to tell you how much they exercise and they right to vote. That's my right to vote. Okay. But why haven't you exercised your right to build your children their own schools yet? Yeah. Why haven't you exercised your right to build a black hospital in Nevada? Why haven't you exercised your right to build a black bank, a black supermarket, a black shipping line, a black manufacturing industry? What about those rights? You know why we love to vote? It requires no sacrifice of time or money. You know why you like to pray? It requires no sacrifice of time or money. You know why you like to march or protest? It requires almost no sacrifice of time and no sacrifice of money. Negroes think you're fighting to be free as long as you don't use no money. And I'm here to tell you that until you organize your dollars for liberation, there will never be no black power. See, Chinese power is founded on the Chinese dollar. Jewish power is founded on the Jewish dollar. Italian, East Indian, Arab, their power is founded on the foundation of their dollar. We want black power without an organized black dollar. You'll never get that. Why is Joe Biden ignoring black folks? Because Joe Biden can ignore black folks because you're the only people in America who vote just because you have a right to do it. You're the only people in America who vote because the Negro bourgeoisie tells you to. You're the only people in America who vote without first getting some campaign pledges before you cast that vote. You have to change the way you function. I'm in total support of a no vote for black people this coming president's election. Show them the power by not giving it to them. He's talking about my ancestors died for me to vote. That's a lie. They didn't die for you to vote. They died for you to get free. Voting was the strategy and tactic in their lifetime that they felt would most likely lead to the freedom. Stop confusing goals with tactics. Nonviolence for Dr. King was a tactic. By any means necessary for Malcolm was a tactic. You don't predetermine tactics. Tactics are determined based upon the circumstances of the battlefield. If being nonviolent going to win us something, we'll be nonviolent. If being violent is going to win us something, we'll be violent. Stop making tactics the goals. The goals have nothing to do with the tactics. The goal is liberation. But let's be honest, most black people don't really want to be free because freedom requires responsibility. 
Black men, we really got to ask ourselves, collectively, are we ready for the white man to take back his welfare, his Section 8 housing, his food stamps, his medical care? Because the white man can roll up on us at any minute and say, black man, you say, we are undermining your masculinity by giving your woman all these free handouts. We're going to take them back and leave the hood. And that means me and we as black men got to step up and fulfill what the white man took away. We got to be willing to do that. But let us be honest. If the white man left Las Vegas today, a group of Negroes will go get him and bring him back tomorrow. That's how much we love white folks. We are in love with white people. Oh, yes, we are. Are you aware we're the only people in the world who got freedom without fighting their oppressor to get it? You're the only people in the world who got freedom without fighting your oppressor in direct confrontation. You got your freedom by fighting with your oppressor. You fought with Abraham Lincoln against the Confederates. You never fought Abraham Lincoln. I want you to understand this. It's what you call the great compromise of 1865, as I call it, when those 204,000 black men who fought in the Civil War in that one black female general, the only woman in American history to lead, lead troops in the battle, Queen Mother Harriet Tubman. Yeah. After we won the war for Abraham Lincoln, we should have declared war on Abraham Lincoln. Are y'all following me? One of the greatest mistakes black people made in America, after winning the war for Abraham Lincoln, we should have declared war on Abraham Lincoln. We might have ended up with four or five states that y'all wanted. Because the US Congress would have said, if these Negroes was able to damn near single-handedly knock off the Confederacy, imagine what they'll do to us. We might have a compromise. But because that white Jesus image is deeply embedded within your subconscious, it's hard for you to declare war on the European because your deity looks like your enemy. And when you think of Jesus, you don't think of a black man. You think of a white one because that is the public image of Jesus in the African mind. See, there's three Jesuses in the Bible. Or excuse me, two. There's Jesus Christ and Jesus Cracker. Some of you worship Jesus Christ. Some of you worship Jesus Cracker. And I'm going to make sure you understand the difference. Jesus Christ was born in the manger. Excuse me. Jesus Christ was born in the cave in Ethiopia. Jesus Cracker was born in a manger in Bethlehem. Jesus Christ was blue, black, purple. Jesus Cracker was a white man with blue eyes. Jesus Christ was hung on a tree. Jesus Cracker was hung on a cross. Jesus Christ was an Ethiopian revolutionary. Jesus Cracker was a metrosexual white man. There's a difference. That image of the Christ is still in the black home today. When I go to homes and do therapy, I still see white Jesus. 400 years later, he's still on your wall. And so one of your assignments today, Las Vegas, is to go home, take down the white Jesus, and burn it. Burn it. And the reason I'm telling you to burn it is because if you sit it outside, Another Negro will come and get the picture and take it home and hang it up. You got to burn the damn crap. Who threw out this good white Jesus picture like this? It's a damn good picture. I had a brother in Jamaica, the land of Garvey and Marley. He hand painted a black Jesus for his church. This is a true story. He hand-painted a black Jesus for his church, and he thought the pastor would be happy. The pastor refused for that painting to ever be hung in his church. The white one is still there. See, this is why we can't talk about economic revolution and political revolution and cultural and intellectual and spiritual revolution until it's a psychological revolution. If you don't kill the Negro inside, the African will never be resurrected. 
You have to kill the Caucasian living in you. All of us got the European in us. Every black woman got a white girl. Every black man got a white boy living in you trying to take over your consciousness. Have you ever seen the movie Alien? Alien is an excellent metaphor for post-traumatic slavery disease in Willie Lynch. The alien is the white power structure. You are the victim. And what does the alien do? It goes to look for people, snatches them up, and then plants the seed inside. That's the Willie Lynch. And that seed sits there, you can't tell that the Willie Lynch is in the Negro at first, can you? We still look like regular black folk. And then one day you wake up in the damn crack of bust out your ass. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You was doing fine. You had on your dashiki. You went to Egypt five times. You changed your name. Ah, my eye broad gap, smut on poo canad broad gap. Right? Ashanti cheese steak, French toast. Frankenstein, green smoothie. Right? And then one day, that cracker bust out you and you ain't never been the same since. But here's the most important lesson about the alien. Once the cracker comes out, the African automatically dies. Do you see that? The purpose of white supremacy is to kill African consciousness. So let's get back to the special ed thing. All my parents in here, I want to give you 10 rules for the schools. And of course, you're going to get my book today so you can get all the other rules that you need. 550 pages. You're going to be reading all summer long. Rule number one, never sign anything you don't take home and read. Black mother, I'm ho I hope you're listening. You have a bad habit of signing any paperwork that the school throws in your face. Stop doing it. The schools depend on black parents to not care enough to read. Don't sign it unless you take it home. And if they tell you we need it today because we're up against the deadline, you tell them that's your fault. If you needed this today, I should have had it last week. This is going home. I'm going to review it with my child's mother, my child's father, my parents. We make all decisions as a family. And then if I decide to sign it, you might, you might get it tomorrow. You have to teach the schools how to treat you. No more signing paperwork on the spot. That's number one. Don't sign nothing at the school. Take it home. Number two, never, and I'm just grabbing my top. Number two, where I put you. Number two. Never sign a release of information form. I hope you're listening, parents. Never sign a release of information form. What is the release of information? It is a form you sign giving the school permission to go behind your back and talk to any professionals that work with your family or child. Why would a black parent give white people permission to talk about your child behind your back without your knowledge? They can call the pediatrician behind your back, probation officer behind your back, caseworker behind your back, therapist behind your back. Never sign release of information. You know what you tell them? If there's ever a need for you to talk with my child's pediatrician, if there's ever a need for you to talk to my child's therapist, if there's ever a need for you to talk to my family social worker, we will schedule a conference so the three or four or five of us can talk face to face. Are y'all following me, black people? That's how you do that. Don't you ever sign that, and many of you have signed it and don't even know you signed it. 
Let me tell you how this happened. See, I was a principal. What they do in the schools, at the beginning of the year, they send you a packet of information to sign. Y'all remember that packet? You get it every year, right? What's in that packet? Free lunch form. Milk in a bag and shit, right? So you sign that. Then they give you early dismissal. Class trip. Permission to see the nurse if they get hurt, right? And then you get tired of signing all them papers that you just start signing and flipping and you not reading. And guess what's at the bottom of the pack? Release of information. So one day you get a phone call from Child Protective Services of Lost and Vega, Nevada, talking about we gotta do an investigation because the school called your social worker and told them that your son came to school every day with the same clothes and he was smelling. And you say, how did the school call my social worker behind my back without my knowledge? I never gave him permission. Oh, yes, you did. It was that last paper you was too lazy to read before you signed it. I work in the schools. I'm telling you what they do. They stick it in the back because they say by the time they get to the fifth one, they're not reading. They just sign. But I also want you to know that you can rescind it. All you have to do is write a letter and say, I am rescinding the release of information from this day forward. You have no legal right to contact any professional service providers for my family or child. I need you to understand that you can rescind anything you give to the school. Did y'all hear that? Guess what else you can rescind, black parents? And by the way, what I'm giving you is federal law. So whether you live in Nevada, California, Seattle, New York, Houston, everything I tell you today, you use wherever you go. I'll be going to St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands soon, because they need the information, because although they're not a state, they're U.S. territory. Special ed over there, too. The other thing you can give back is permission for them to evaluate your child. In other words, some of y'all sitting here right now, you gave them permission to evaluate your child. But you hear some stuff from Dr. Umar today, and you're going to read some stuff in Dr. Umar's book you want to buy today that's going to convince you that my baby don't need to be tested right now. But Dr. Umar already told him to do it. You can resend it, write a letter. And I have a sample letter in my book that you can copy and send in. And it says, I'm hereby notifying the school, or I'm hereby demanding that all testing and evaluation procedures being conducted on my child be terminated immediately. I am no longer interested in the psychological evaluation at this time. Should I change my mind in the future, I will request another evaluation. You can stop it. And guess what? As the school psychologist, if I get that form, I can't get your kid no more. It's done with. I don't care if I'm in the middle of the IQ test. If I get that letter saying the parent said no more testing, I'm rescinding my request, the testing stops immediately. Or I can lose my job or credential. You can always take it back, parents. Number one, you don't sign. Number two, don't sign a release of information. Number three, don't go to any meetings by yourself. Mothers bring the father, father bring the mother. If mother and father ain't getting along, mother find a brother, uncle and cousin. Father bring a niece, auntie. It's always good to have both genders represented. Because if you show up with a whole bunch of brothers with no woman, they're going to say you try to turn the place out. Right? And sisters, you got to bring a man with you in case they try to get disrespect. So it's good to balance out. And sisters in Las Vegas, if you can't find you a good alpha male to come to the meeting, because, you know, alpha males is like, we more, what they call it, endangered species than the silverbacks. Right? America is going around killing alpha males. And they're replacing us with sugarback males. <laughs> no. I will never disrespect the homosexual brothers, bisexual, queer, transgender, but I reserve the right to disagree with the life style. And the reason I reserve the right to disagree with the lifestyle is because there's no way you can be for the black family and support behavior that kills off the black family. Do you understand? I do not hate you. My lesbian sisters, I do not hate you. 
Most of you not lesbian anyway, you just ain't had the right masculine vibration around your ass yet. Oh yeah. You get the right outfit around there, she'll start dancing for that ass. Don't get it twisted, see, we can change it all. But in America, it's illegal to do therapy on people who no longer want to be sexually confused. Oh yes, it is illegal. If they catch a psychologist engaging in conversion therapy, even if you say, I don't want to be this, I want help, psychologist says, I can help you not be that no more. You will lose your job, you will lose your license, you will lose your credentials. It is illegal in America to help sexually confused people become normal again. And let me be clear, they don't care about gay black people anymore, they're straight black people. This is about killing off the black population. That's why you see all these gay commercials and biracial commercials, because they want our kids to abandon traditional black family structure. That's what this is. Do you know the Center for Disease Control reported a year or two ago that teenage pregnancy in the black community is down for the first time since like 1968. They said black, the teenage pregnancy. You know why it's down? Because lesbianism is up. Yes. But the problem that white folks is having, brothers and sisters, and I don't wish no harm on them, but the problem white folks is having is by killing us, by pushing that on our children, they're killing their own group. Do you know 25 United States have a zero birth growth rate for white folks? Do your research when you go home if you don't think I'm telling the truth. Associated Press reported it. 25 states have more white people dying than being born. You know why? Because they're trying to push this on our kids, but their kids are grabbing it and it's reducing their numbers. Why do you think the white man is so concerned about his dwindling population? Every time you turn on CNN, what are they talking about? Americans are shrinking. But why are you shrinking? Is it a coincidence you're shrinking in the very same generation and decade that you've been pushing same-sex relationships? It's a consequence. And I would also argue that part of the reason police genocide is up and violence is up against black folk is because the white man is reacting to the threat of his own extermination. I'm not wishing it on them. I'm just giving you the psychological analysis. I help white folks. I help Chinese. They call me up. Arabs, East Indians. I had one white mom try to crush on me. I'm not interested in that. I don't want to eat. Mayonnaise, please, for the rest of my damn life. I like a little paprika and jerk on for my weed. <laughs> the snow bunny thing is out of control. It's so bad that when a black man get around a group of white women, they assume we want them. I mean, they can be the nastiest looking lizards you've ever seen. But they will assume my water. No ass, no shape. <laughs> Three chins, six necks, no ankles. I don't want you. But because black men been going so crazy over this thing, and then you don't even get the cute ones, you get the nasty ones. And then when the white, when the black man with the white woman, he don't even want to speak to the black woman. Have you seen this? He got to go out of his way to prove to Miss Fat Back that he don't want no more melody. And see, black man, I understand the white woman got a natural attraction to you because the first law of human nature is self-preservation. So the reason why the white woman loves the tall, dark, and handsome is because her DNA calls out for a life shot. She wants to procreate herself 
because she understands genetically the fact that she lacks the melanin can cause a reduction in white reproduction. So her unconscious calls out to the black man melanin to please help me survive. The white woman's attraction for the black man is an unconscious genetic love and quest for survival. So I know why the white woman is attracted to me. Because the white male does not guarantee her survival because he's just as recessive as she is. So she'd rather have the mixed race African child than no child at all. And let us be clear. White women aren't only having one or two babies because they just sophisticated and no, they're not able to conceive at the rate black women can. Read the old medical studies. Not the new ones. Go back to the 60s and 50s and 70s where they said it in their own paperwork. She's not as fertile. That's why she takes fertility drugs. You see them on CNN once a year, 15 bald-headed white babies all born at once. <laughs> Peggy Sue of Southern Vermont gave birth to 24 big-headed white babies. <laughs> We don't have to do that. Black women are the mothers. Black men are the fathers. And then the young people at the colleges, they love the Dr. Uma. Why nobody like black folks? I'll tell you why. Rule number one, you're melanin. You're the only people in the world who can reproduce yourself and any other people in the world. I can make a black baby with the Chinese. I can make a black baby with the white woman. I can make a black baby with the Arab, the East Indian. I would never do such a thing, but I could. The white man can't go to no other woman and reproduce himself. The white man can only reproduce himself in a white woman, that's it. There's a genetic reproductive inferiority complex. See, black men, we have physically and sexually objectified the white man's reproductive insecurity complex. We think it's about size, right? Black man, yeah, white man jealous of us because we bigger. It ain't got nothing to do with your size because not all brothers have size. Ladies will tell you that. Right, ladies? She said you have Deanna sausage. It's not size, it's genetic potency. That's why when they hung black folks, over 5,000 black folks was lynched between 1865 and 1920. You, and most of the time when they lynched us, they castrated us. They hung Chinese, didn't castrate. Hung Jews, didn't castrate. Hung Italians, didn't castrate. 99% of the time when they hung black males, castration. Why did they cut off your reproductives but never did it to other people? Because that's the jealousy, not the size. Your ability to reproduce yourself in any woman in the world. How do you get rid of the people who can reproduce themselves? So some of y'all say, well, Dr. Umar, we can reproduce ourselves, brother. But shouldn't we just go ahead and spread the love? No, you shouldn't. Because when you reproduce yourself, not all, but some of our mixed race African brothers and sisters will develop a psychological complex and a loyalty to the oppressor's blood. You cause a confusion, not in all, but in some. This is why some mixed race Africans, not all because I know some who go harder than y'all, but some of them have an issue because if my mother's white, how can I say race first? If my father's white, how can I say all white people are racist? It's a confusion thing because you're asking them to speak out against a part of who they are. And the only way we deal with that complex is to not reproduce outside the race. If we are of royal blood, if we all agree that as Africans we are of royal blood, if you study royal reproductive behavior, royals do not mix, except with other royal families. Are y'all following me? Yes. So if you are a king, stop calling yourself a king, black man, and you run around with somebody else's woman. A king wouldn't do that. A king would only be caught with a queen. 
The black woman is God, and you laid up with some nasty Caucasian mayonnaise man. You ain't God, because a God this would not have a devil sleeping in her bed. Rule number four. Never go to the meetings by yourself is rule number three. Black men, I need black men to honor that. Why do I need black men to honor that? Because when black men go to the school by yourself and you start checking them white teachers, they're going to exaggerate and say you threaten them. And you're going to get a restraining order and you'll never be allowed to go into that school again. So brothers, always take a sister with you to mellow out the energy. And black woman, if you can't find no alpha male, go to the corner and get a couple corner boys to go in that meeting with you. Uh huh. Get some game bangers in that damn IEP. Oh yeah. Get Ray Ray and Mike Mike in there. With all their colors on red, blue, all that shit. And tell them to come up in there. And say, Mike Mike, I don't want y'all to say nothing. Because you're going to mess it up. Just stand there, look as gangster as you can look, smell like weed, red, bull, 40 ounce, I don't give a shot. And the minute the white folks start talking about my son needs some Adderall or some Ritalin or some Concerta or some Metadate or some Cycler or some Risperdal or some Prozac or some Paxil, soon when they start pushing the mess, I want you to bang your fist on the table one time and all y'all gonna open your eyes real wide and give them the gangster look. It won't be no more ADHD. White folks are scared of black men who ain't got nothing to lose. I'm serious, it works. Tell them coming in with a white beater on, tattoos out, the whole nine, pants, sagging, tempo. Yeah! And then the white folks are like, oh my God, we didn't know you were bringing people with you. <laughs> If they got four or five people in the meeting, you should have four or five people in the meeting. Don't let them gang up on you, because they love to gang up on black women. They'll have one black woman and 20 white folks. The principal, principal intern, school nurse, school counselor, psychologist, reading specialist, grade leader, home and school, dean of students. Why do they gang up on you, black mother? To intimidate you. The idea is if we circle her with all our degrees, and make her think she's intellectually inferior. The black mother will sign off just to get out of this uncomfortable meeting. This is what they do. I call it a schoolhouse lynching. Don't go by yourself. Rule number four, don't get children evaluated under the age of eight unless they have a real organic disability. Now, special education is 13 disabilities, brothers and sisters. They are autism, emotional disturbance, intellectual disability, the learning disability, which has eight types itself, reading comprehension, reading fluency, basic reading skills, math calculations, math reasoning, Oral expression, listening comprehension, written expression. There's eight types of the one specific learning disability, SLD. And then you have deaf children, blind children, orthopedically impaired children, multiple disability children, developmentally delayed children. You have 13, but there's four that I call the Jim Crow disabilities because those are the ones they use on black kids. What are the four? Learning disability, emotional disturbance, intellectual disability, and other health impairment for ain't no daddy at home disorder, ADHD. And why do I call it ain't no daddy at home? Because more than 80% of black boys diagnosed with ADHD don't have a father. And when did we get ADHD? When did we get it? 1980, same year CIA dropped off crack. They started drugging the kids with the Ritalin the same year they was drugging the family in the streets. Chemical warfare against the whole community. They was locking up black men, leaving the mothers at home, the discipline wasn't there, 
the emotional nurturance wasn't there because the mother couldn't do it all by herself, understandably. So they made a disability up out of thin air to make $30 billion a year off black folks. They are making a killing on Wall Street because you keep on letting white folks convince you to take your child to the psychiatrist for crack. And let us be clear, Ritalin is crack. Metadate is crack. Cycler is crack. Adderall is crack. These drugs are one molecule, most of them away from crack cocaine. So you mean to tell me your son's father in jail for selling crack, but it's okay to give it to his son? Look at the hypocrisy! I got a letter in the mail from the Attorney General of Pennsylvania. As soon as that book came out, excuse me, two weeks before the book came out, I got a letter from the Attorney General telling me we're going to take your credentials away from you if you don't stop Pennsylvania, if you don't stop engaging in bigoted speech. This is what they told me. So I'm going to write them back. And I'm going to say, do whatever you want, because the best slave is a free slave crack. So if you want to free me, take the chains off, devil! I'm going to keep teaching and doing what I'm doing. See, the reason I'm the only school psychologist you know who teaches this is because most black psychologists get paid from the system. They will never, I should have not been the first psychologist to tell you that special ed was a money hustle. I'm the first one to tell you that all these black psychologists, nobody ever told the black community that special ed is a business. What do you mean, Dr. Johnson? It's the business. I mean that if I evaluate one of these babies and I say they have an intellectual disability or autism, or if I say they have an ADHD problem or learning problem or they needed some speech therapy, their name goes into a computer and it goes to the State Department of Education for Nevada. And by the end of the month, after I give them an IEP, a welfare check will be sent to the school for that child. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You don't believe me? Do yourself a little homework. Call your State Department of Education, Bureau of Special Ed, and ask them, what is the special ed subsidy for children in Las Vegas? and see if it don't blow your mind. In Philadelphia, the special ed kids get an extra $20,000. Oh yeah, this is money! Ain't nobody think about your child! And what bothers me, most black kids are special ed for the what? Learning disability. Most kids in Nevada, black and special ed, are there for the learning disability. Reading, reading and math, because you know black kids are allergic to books and shit. Have you noticed? They get measles, you take a book out, they get the flu. Have you seen that? They don't open up a math workbook, they get COVID, bronchitis, measles. And why are black kids allergic to reading and math? Because parents have allowed your child to get addicted to video games and social network. So in your house, there's no books. I'm willing to bet if I go into half the homes of you in here, and half the homes of black folks in Las Vegas in the community. I'm willing to bet in at least half those houses, I will not find a dictionary, I will not find a thesaurus, I will not find a complete set of encyclopedia A to Z. I bet you, I bet you I know, because I do mobile therapy. And the first thing I do when I go into a child's home is look for reading material, and there is none. Whole bunch of Jordans, whole bunch of video games, iPads, laptops, big screen TVs. There's nothing worse than when I go into a home for therapy and there's no reading material, but they got a big screen TV. And the screen's so damn big that it's bigger than the wall that it's on. So they had to count the clock the shit. Y'all know them purity ghetto. Why the hell did you get a smaller screen? The screen bigger than the damn wall, so you gotta look at TV this way. Because they need a four more inches. Had to take the white Jesus off and move him over here. <laughs> and then people get mad at me for saying I want a residential school where the parents can't come but once in a while. You're damn right I want a residential school where parents can't come once in a while. Because with all due respect, the parents are the problem. 
And that's not just true for black folks. It's true for everybody, but we're talking about ourselves. In fact, there's some child psychologists who would argue there's no need to do therapy with kids. It's a waste of time, because if you don't change the way the parents interact with the kids, you'll never alleviate the child's problem. Which is why if I was in charge, we wouldn't diagnose kids, we'd diagnose the homes they come from. Why are y'all so quick to get them tested? Y'all so quick? Why is a first grader being tested for reading problems? Why is the kindergartner being tested for ADHD? Can you prove ADHD? No! Can you prove a reading disability? No! Is there a blood test for a reading disability? Is there an extra? Where is the reading disability located? Can somebody tell me? Is it in the back? Maybe it's up here. Where the reading disability? Is it over here? Is it the third eye? Where is the reading disability in the brain? Can you see it anywhere? What about emotional disturbance? Where is the ED at? Is it in the front? Is it in the side? Huh? Is it in the hippocampus? Where is it at? Is it in the prefrontal? Can somebody show me where the ED? You can't. You know why? Because it's not a fact. It's an idea. It's an opinion. It's a hypothesis. If your child got an IEP right now for reading a map, show me. Prove to me that he really got it. He ain't got it. You know what he got? Not a learning disability, but a lazy disability. Uh, uh. 90% of all children of every race that I've ever tested didn't have a learning disability. They had a lazy disability. It's not that he couldn't learn how to read. He didn't want to. It's not that your daughter don't know how to do fractions. She don't want to. Because she going to be the next Nikki and Cardi. <laughs> your son ain't got to learn how to read for what? I'm going to be the next Michael Vick. That's the problem. We got our boys and girls thinking they're going to live a comfortable life being an entertainer. Well, I got news for you. And for my young people who are here, I got news for you. A black man has a greater chance of being struck by lightning than becoming a professional athlete. Did you know that? Statistically, you're more likely to get struck by lightning than to become a professional athlete. And if it was up to me, I would ban the NFL and the NBA any damn way. I would ban them. In fact, I'm wrestling with myself as to whether or not we're even going to have football and basketball at FDMG. I'm serious. I don't know if I want to do it because we keep on socializing black boys towards physical power and strength the same way slavery did. <laughs> LeBron James' worth, who I respect, LeBron James' worth is calculated the same way your great, great, great grandfather's worth was calculated on the plantation. The only difference between LeBron James and your great, 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 great grandfather in Mississippi, Alabama, is LeBron gets a subsidy. Your grandfather did. We are still valuing black men for their physical strength and ability. That's what slavery did. How are we any better? I don't want him going to the NFL or NBA. Because I know he's going to get a white agent who's going to engineer a white woman in his life. Half these black athletes don't even know the white girl you got, you didn't even choose them. They were sent to you by the agent so they can know everything going on in your life. And you happen to marry her. See, this is what's wrong with new black money. See, black money and white money don't operate on the same terms. Rich white men don't marry broke white girls. Yeah. Let me say it again. Rich white men do not marry broke white girls. The only millionaires in America marrying broke white girls are black athletes and entertainers. In other words, the only white woman you are allowed to have are the white women that other black men don't want. Excuse me, the white, 
women that other white men don't want. You get the leftovers. You don't marry into royalty. You marry the broke. There's nothing against the white woman. If she can find her a dumb coon worth 20 million that she can spend a few years with and then divorce him and take half of everything he got, why not? I love Kanye West. He's coonish, but he needs some therapy. But I know Kim didn't have three, four, five babies just to have. She knew what she was doing. Even if we got a prenup. The fact I got a half dozen of your black babies. Are y'all following me? It's going to dictate I get a chunk of that. And then what did the white man do to help Kim Kardashian out? As soon as they file for divorce, they start putting Kanye West's net worth all over the news. Did y'all see that? They want to make sure Kim know how much he got. Kanye West is one of the three richest black men in America. Why did that come out right after she filed for divorce? So she can get it all. Kim, he hiding some stuff. Make sure you get that easy money. And I don't think Kanye a bad dude. I just think after he lost his significant other, he never got the help that he needed because he's in the upper echelon. I don't know if Kanye got anybody around him who genuinely cares about Kanye. Are y'all following me? Because I don't think he's a bad person. I can tell he loves people. He's a good brother. But he ain't got no consciousness. I wish I could spend a day with Kanye. Sit your ass down. No more white girls. That's the first one. Go back to Chicago and find one of them sisters who held you down when you was broke and make them the new wife. No more devils in your bedroom. I do not think Kanye is bad. So let's this. Next rule, number five. Let's stay with this eval for a minute. Don't get the kids evaluated under the age of seven because you can't prove it. Furthermore, if you put your baby in special ed at such a young age, if you find out later they didn't have the problem, you still have a problem because now the child has identified with the disability. Are y'all following me? So my next rule, rule number six, never tell the children that they have a disability. I'm going to say it again. Why would you tell a five-year-old you have ADHD? Why would you tell a six-year-old you have autism? Why would you tell a seven-year-old you have a reading disability? Just because you was dumb enough to believe a white person's opinion about your child's intellectual feeling doesn't mean your child has to believe it. You never share labels with kids. That's crazy. You want to tell a black boy, you know you don't have no control over your behavior. It's not your fault. Why the hell would you do that? Because guess what? When the police say freeze, when the police say stop, and he's still moving because my mom said I got conduct disorder. I don't have to control myself. Do the police have to respect them labels? Do you see how many mentally ill black folks have been getting killed by police? Police don't care about them damn labels. Stop giving our children these imaginary crutches that they use thinking they're going to get over on white folks. You can't. And I'm going to tell you adult something. You better stop applying for these SSI crazy checks y'all be trying to get. Y'all better stop. And the reason I'm telling you that under these new gun laws that a Biden is proposing, if you have been determined to be psychologically unhealthy, or if you take psychiatric medication, or in many states, if you have a marijuana card, you cannot carry a firearm. Did y'all hear that? Oh, yes. I was at the gun store. I had to get a gun for y'all. Calls me all times of the night. White folks, black folks. I'm at the gun store, and the customer had a, he said, do you have a marijuana card? He said, yes. He said, oh, you can't get no license to carry. I said, what you mean? In Pennsylvania, in most states, if you have a medical marijuana card, you cannot carry a licensed firearm, a concealed weapon. You can't. Some of y'all getting the SSI check for schizophrenia where you fake the schizophrenia. 
right? You mentally unstable for six hundred dollars a month and shit. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You will not be able to carry a gun. Please understand the ramifications yeah. of these financial hustles that you run. Come on, talk to them and some of y'all put your children in harm's way because when they get 21, they won't be able to carry because you let the white man diagnose them up, drug them up, and do everything else. He won't be able to carry a gun. Come on, this is what they do. They are disarming black folks with our own help. And don't give your guns away. Get more of them. I don't like the way America's going, and you got to be prepared. Start stocking up. I'm serious. Get you a knife, get you a bow and arrow, get you a damn slingshot. Get it all. I'm about to go get that damn archery thing, too. I'm serious. These white folks is out here, and they're crazy, and we don't know when America's going to let them loose on the black community. I totally believe when they let the white folks overrun the Capitol building, I believe that was a test run for martial law. And I believe that was a potential alibi. So when the white folks overrun the black community, they can say, well, they overran the Capitol too, and we couldn't do nothing about it. That's right. That's right. That's right. Be careful, y'all. Be armed and be organized. Brothers and sisters, racism is our main problem. But black complicity is our second problem. And I need y'all to understand the rules of racism, and that is all white people are racist. All white people are racist. Every white person you know is a racist. There's no white person who is not a racist. Now don't confuse me with saying every white person is a bigot or every white person hates black folks. Most of them do, but not every last one. Racism is not about hate. Racism is about power. You do not have to hate black people to be a racist. You just have to want to control black people's opportunities. Racism is not about how you feel. Racism is about what you want to control. And this is why some of you have a hard time understanding that your white coworkers and your white neighbors and your white sister-in-law and your white mother-in-law, they're racist too. All white people protected. You can't have white people who don't protect racism because if you get too many of them, the system will fall apart. It requires constant upkeep. Every white person, I had a white person that called in the radio, Dr. Umar, my ancestors didn't own black folks. I'm off the hook. No, you ain't devil. And why aren't they off the hook? They're not off the hook because even if your ancestors didn't own mine, they still benefited from the enslavement of mine. Your ancestors had privileges just because mine did not. Your ancestors had access to resources just because mine did not. Your ancestors were able to get land because mine were not. What did your ancestors do for a living? Did they work on the railroad? Well, how did they get to work on the railroad? Because slavery had empowered the American economy so much that it made railroads necessary. What's your ancestor do? He was a sea man on a ship? Well, how did he end up being a sea man on the ship? Because slavery had so empowered the American economy that it created jobs for white folks on the open sea. Your father was a police officer. Why did he become a police officer? Because slavery demonized and criminalized all white, excuse me, all black folks, which gave jobs to white folks to patrol us. Show me how you don't benefit from slavery. Today, you get loans because I can't. You get jobs because I can't. Your privilege is a direct reflection of my discrimination. Stop letting white people turn racism into an emotional game. How I feel. I don't hate black people. That has nothing to do with it. But I'm willing to bet that if one of them, if you saw one outside your house, you'll call the damn police, wouldn't you? Rule number two, white people don't share power with black folks. White folks don't share power with black folks. No, no, no. They want to monopolize power. That's why in Las Vegas you see them signs talking about a new community, a new beginning, a multicultural city that's alive. They're moving black folks out of Las Vegas. They want you gone. 
And the best way to get rid of black folks is to make you think you're actually including them. And you know what they do on the East Coast and in the Midwest to get rid of black folks? They open up charter schools. Do y'all have charter schools yet? Las Vegas got charters? The charter school is the best weapon of ethnic cleansing. You know why? If I want to get rid of black folks out of Las Vegas, all I'll do is open up a charter school in the middle of the hood. Black folks are going to be so happy there's a new school for their kids. They're not going to find out who is opening up this charter. And then when they see 90% white folks hired at the charter school, they're still not going to say nothing. And then those 90% white folks who work at the charter school in the black community are going to buy up all the abandoned houses and lots and storefronts. And you're still not going to say nothing because you're going to say it looks like a good thing for my baby's teacher to live down the street. And then the city going to raise the property tax value on your house. And so now black homeowners are going to start selling off their property. And before you know it, that area of Vegas that was so black is so white because the charter school came in and moved you out. The charter school is the face of gentrification. And you got all these black politicians running around Las Vegas. I want to represent you. Vote for me. I ain't voting for none of them unless they can ask you some questions. Question number one. What are you going to do to stop gentrification in Las Vegas? No answer, no vote. Number two, what are you going to do to economically empower black folks so we can compete for the dollar in this city the way the Mexicans and the Asians and the white man are doing? Because all of them got access to loans and banks and lines of credit, and black folks can't compete because we don't get those lines of credit. What are you going to do to economically invest in black folks? No answer, no vote. What are you going to do about police genocide and police brutality and law of Vegas? And I don't want to hear about no damn community review board with no damn power. Every city you go to, they got a community review board with no damn power. How about we make it a hate crime? Automatically, white cop kill an unarmed black person. It's a hate crime, federal hate crime right off the bat. I don't want to hear nothing else, hate crime. Number two, we want the police to look like the community they police. Now don't get me wrong. We got some coonish police. Yes, we do. I know some black cops worse than the white. But guess what? I would rather a black police officer pull me over than a white. Because black police don't have a history of killing black folks. They are following me. Even the coons don't have a history of killing black folks the way white folks do. Why don't the police look like us? And do you know that most of the police in the black community come from outside of that community and don't have no experience in that community? You want them to kill us. Why would you hire an ex-military cutout who lived in an outback white suburb with nothing but KKK and bring him to the middle of the ghetto of Las Vegas to be a cop? You want him to kill black folks. And I don't hear no black politicians talking about a redistribution of officer personnel so they look like the people they police. Why don't we see that? You know what else we need to see? When police get charged, they don't get their defense paid for by the taxpayer. They don't get their defense paid for by the police union. It's going to come out your damn pension. You're going to pay for your defense, not the people. How are you going to kill a black person and then have black people pay for the white cop's retirement? No! You lose your pension when you kill a black person. But ain't nobody talking about that. In the Congressional Black Caucus, what good are they? I'm trying to find out what they doing up there in Capitol Hill. You right down the street from the president, but you can't go have a conversation. You made black people vote this white man in. He ain't did nothing for us, and you won't even walk up the street for a conversation. The least thing you can do is call Kamala Harris down for a meeting and find out why the hell she's telling people America not racist. Y'all won't even hold her accountable. What good are you? NAACP and Urban League. What good are you? The only thing you do is make black people vote for white people every four years. If you ain't got no, what's, what's your plan to make the public schools better? What is your plan to hire more black men and women in Las Vegas public schools? Not as classroom assistants, not as lunchtime aides, but as principals, assistant principals, deans, and classroom instructors. 
And don't tell me they don't have the certification. Because a lot of these white folks don't have the certification. These white folks belong to Teach for America and all these other programs that will give them a job in the black ghetto without no credential. So don't tell me you can't do it for black folks because you do it for white folks all the time. As I prepare to wrap up and take some questions. Six years ago, we started raising money for a school. And I want to say thank you to Nevada because we get a lot of donation checks from Las Vegas and Reno. I want to thank y'all. Because y'all all the way out here in the desert and shit with no water. And for you to have enough love to send me a check to the other side of the country where you got to drink out of a cactus, I love you. <laughs> but I also want to say this. I want y'all to be there when we have the grand opening. Because that's your school too. That school belongs to everybody who donated to it. Everybody who donated to it owns the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. And I'm hoping, brothers and sisters, that we'll get the Marcus Garvey Elementary School completely renovated by the end of the summer. That's the goal. We close. We close. I finally found the HVACA and the plumber that I need. I think we're going to make it. Yes, I think we're going to make it. I think we're going to make it. And you know the haters, they praying to the devil that I don't open that damn school. They on their knees to white Mary, Jesus, and Joseph. Don't let me my two days. Them niggas are stink. Could you imagine? They wait for that Instagram live for me to say to school. It's going to be OB. It's coming, brothers and sisters. And don't listen to the haters now. We got a beautiful campus. Yeah. The schools are modern, they're in shape, they were just vandalized. The electric and the plumbing and the HVAC, but the school is good. Yes. So we want to get the Garvey building done and the Nat Turner gym done, and then once we get the Garvey side done, then we got to get the big school done, and that's the Frederick Douglass High School. And once we get the whole campus done, it will be the largest independent black school campus in America right now. No other independent school has the facilities that we got. Come on in, family, no problem. Yeah, we got a $300,000 tax bill that the white folks threw on us, hoping we can't pay it. But that's all right. I got to talk to them next week, and we're going to do a payment plan. We come too far to quit now. It's only hard because the universe want to make sure we really want it. See, black people need a victory. And the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, it ain't everything but it's something. And I need you to be able to walk into a space that you own, that you built, with no white help and no white handout and say we did this ourselves. We gotta get back to depending on ourselves. It's gonna be a school in the daytime, but it's gonna be Black Wall Street at the nighttime. We gonna have, once a month, a black vendor market. We're going to open up the gymnasiums. And every black person with a business on a road taking the first weekend it'll be y'all and the next weekend it'll be somebody else. And this will be a one-stop shop. So if you black and you want to buy nothing but black, you can come to one place and get everything black from one place. And then I want to have for all my alpha males in here, because I know we got this manosphere shit going on. This anti-black woman movement. But for black men who don't have a problem showing love and honor to our black women, I want to have a program where we honor and patronize the queen once a season. And so black women, you'll come to the school, and black men will give you a pedicure. And black men will give you a manicure. And then we're going to feed you all food cooked by black men. And then we're going to sing and play instruments. Everything will be nice and clean. Now, what you do after the event? <laughs> That's not on FDMG. OK? But we want to show that black people can be African again. And then I want to have an international conference for the black man where black men come together. No women around, just us to talk about us. And then a black woman's conference. And then I want to have the Black Farmers Conference and the Black 
media conference in a black investment conference in a black art conference. And then a black cool conference. And if you got the snow bunny prices, we're gonna have a snow bunny conference and hit a lot of Negroes who can't find a black woman. But I want it to be a place where you can always come and know it's gonna be something positive going on for the family. So we got a lot of, we got some more work to do, but I'm feeling better now than I felt in the two years since we bought the school. But here's what I want everybody to know. I believe we're going to cross the finish line this summer, but even if we don't, I like where we at. Everybody got criticism, but what are you building? All I see people building is more YouTube pages and more Instagram pages and more TikTok pages and Clubhouse. And I'm trying to find out how black folks got all these problems and you got so much time on your hands to spend on social media. We ain't got no schools, no banks, no distribution, no shipping, no factories, no hospitals, but you spend five hours on YouTube a day. Three hours on TikTok. I got Negroes stalking me to get on Clubhouse. Dr. Johnson, if they could just hear your voice in our room. I'm not getting your damn room. There's coons in that room. And then when I go sign up for Clubhouse, it's like 50 Umar Johnson's already been signed the hell up. People using my name. That's why I got to make sure y'all on my page. I got fake Instagram. I even got a fake Cash App. So for those of y'all who buy the book today using Cash App, you got to make sure you do dollar sign Dr. Umar Johnson. Because if you do dollar sign Dr. Umar, that's a fake one. And it got the same picture. Yes. Dollar sign Dr. Umar is not me. They got fake FDMG. This is what Negroes do when they ain't got no life. That's why we got to have re-Africanization classes at the school. So we can get our African mind back. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, make sure your children read at least one hour a night. Every black child should read at least an hour every single night without fail. Why do we want our kids to read, parents? Four reasons you must read. You too, not just the child. Number one, new vocabulary. They'll do better in school. Number two, it improves their ability to write. They're going to need it in school. Number three, it improves their ability to conversate. They're going to need it in school. Number four, it improves their general knowledge of facts and information. Your child doesn't do better at the white private school because it's necessarily a better school. They do better at the white private school because they are exposed to a higher level of working vocabulary. The weapon that they use to confuse our kids on the Nevada State Academic Assessment is the words. They give our kids confusing words in the questions, and it is the words that they use that are leading our babies to get the answers wrong. Trust me. I'm a school psychologist, I get tests for a living. Sometimes I'm looking at the test like, you could have asked that a lot simpler. You could have asked that a lot simpler. They are intentionally confusing the question because they know black kids don't read. Do you know the average black child has a working vocabulary level that's three levels below their class? 12th graders read on the ninth grade, and ninth graders read on the sixth and talk on the sixth. And the best time to help a child build vocabulary is when? Two to five. That's when the vocab will explode by thousands of words. But what do most black children do between the age of two and five? They watch TV. So the best time to help them build a vocabulary, they waste it away. Brothers and sisters, if you want to work at Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey, send me your resume. FDMGResumes at gmail.com. If you buy a book today, you're going to get a bookmark. The email address is on the bookmark. Send me your resume. Ladies, you don't have to be natural right now. It's okay. 
It's okay. The school, if we get the school open this summer, we're going to open school next summer. Open the building this summer. Start the school for the kids next summer. So you got over 12 months to let your new growth come back. Because I know you got bald spots under there. And ladies, you're talking to a barber. I was trained to cut hair. Sometimes it's best to go bald and start fresh. Stop trying to baby that little bald spot with the two hairs around. Cut that shit off. I'm tired of seeing it. No, I'm serious. Sometimes it's best to go bald and start fresh. If you notice, a lot of sisters who go bald, they get a full head of hair. You keep trying to save that damaged root. Keep watering that little cactus. Cut that shit off. And black men, you gotta help your woman have confidence in her beauty, because beauty comes from within, not from without. Make her go bald and massage her bald head every day. Kiss it with some kiwi butter, some shea butter, some strawberry lemon almond butter. Let her sit out in the sun, and before you know it, the hair come back. And black woman, don't trivialize how beautiful you look when you cut your hair down. I have never seen a black woman who went with short hair where it did not intensify the beauty. And the reason it intensifies the beauty is because it accentuates your facial features. Does everybody remember Sanaa Lathan? When she cut her hair, that she was already my Hollywood crush, minus the perm, right? But when she cut her hair down, she went 50 times more beautiful. You really saw the beauty in the face, and far too often black women, y'all cover y'all beauty up with that hair. The skinniest little girl with 200 pounds of weave on. Look like a mop. What the hell is that? So that's why for FDMG, you got to be natural. And after we open up the boys' school, we got to open up the girls' school. And they got to be natural too. The girls got to be natural too. And if you forget to make your girl natural, don't worry, I'm a barber. I keep a fresh set of walls on me. And I'm a ball her but I'm gonna make her love it ball. Oh yes, oh yes. All my girl students is gonna love who they are when they come out of FDMG if nothing else. Yeah. They ain't gonna need the white man perm, his weed, his extension. <coughs> we are spending $30 billion a year on hair and beauty. Do you know what we can do with an extra $30 billion a year in black America? <laughs> in black man? I blame you as much as the queen because the reason she wants to look like a European is because what we want to be with is a European. The black woman would not be frying her hair up like that and wearing them weaves if we didn't think it was sexy. Let's be honest. A lot of black men ain't comfortable enough with a woman looking purely natural. That's why she's synthetic. If black men said we ain't dating a sister who's not natural, they'll all be natural in 48 hours. It ain't a woman in here who don't want some milk with her cookies once in a while. We got some young people over there. I want to give y'all five minutes. High school or college? Somebody yell out, high school or college? I got some couple things for my high school people. Number one, make sure you come out of high school with the QPA a 3.0 or higher so you can qualify for the scholarships. Do not go to college unless you know you're going to finish. The worst thing you can do is go to the University of Nevada or University of Las Vegas or Cali or Washington and go for two years and then drop out. Now you owe forty to $60,000 a year and you don't even have a credential to help pay it off with. When you go to college, make sure you major in something that is financially relevant in the black community. Do not go to school. Do not go to college and choose a major that you can't earn with it. A degree in art history. What do you want to do with a degree in art history? What do you want to do with a degree in grasshopper reproduction? Make sure the degree matters. And I'm going to tell you something else. Don't let the college try to trick you 
into choosing a different major. I'm going to tell you what they're going to do. Let's say you want to be pre-law or engineering. They're going to make you take a placement test. And they're going to come to you and they're going to say you didn't score high enough on your placement test. And because you didn't score high enough on your placement test, you can't be engineering. You can't be pre-law. And then they might say, maybe you want to be a social worker. Maybe you want to be a gym teacher. Now, there's nothing wrong with either of those. But that's not what you wanted. I would rather you drop out and tell them to resend your loans or your scholarship money and find another school. Don't you dare let somebody put you into financial debt for a degree you don't even want. And I'm going to tell you also this. If you're going to go to college, get out in four years. Don't be no professional student. Don't be taking five and seven and nine and 12. You be a damn grandfather before you get your bachelor's. You go to college to finish, not to stay. And I'm gonna tell you this, if you're not sure as to whether you wanna to go to college, go to trade school. Listen to me. I love what I do as a psychologist, but if I could do it over, I would've went to trade school first. I was in the barbering program in high school. The white folks made me drop out because they said, you're going to college, you need to get calculus and physics. I didn't even need it. They didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I should have stayed and had my barbering license, and I probably had barbering programs all over for the kids on top of it. So my point is, if you go to trade school, ladies and gentlemen, two years is all it takes. Become a licensed plumber, licensed electrician, licensed HVAC, licensed roofer, licensed welder, licensed auto mechanic. Two years, and you now have a skill that can pay the bills. And then you can still go to college. You can still go to college after your two-year trade certificate. But now, if you don't finish college, you have a license. And you can now go and work for yourself. Do you know what it costs us to get the electric fixed in our Garvey building? Just the Garvey building, not the Douglas. Ten classrooms quarter of a million dollars. The HVAC, the lowest quote I got was $250,000. The plumbing, $100,000. Guess how long it's going to take them to do the electric for $250,000? Three weeks. Guess how long it's going to take them to do the HVAC? Two weeks. Guess how long it's going to take them to do a plumbing? $100,000 for the plumber, and he'll be done in two weeks. That's more money than the surgeon. That's more money than the engineer. We have to stop telling our kids they got to go to college, make them go to trade school first. If I could do it all over again, I would have got my barbering license. Consider trade school first. And to my ladies, whether you go to college or trade school, you're not going to fall in love. You're going to get your education. I have seen so many young sisters thirsty for that love, go to college to fall in love get pregnant, and have to forfeit a four-year scholarship. Please stay focused on the books. The boys will be there when you're done. Trust me. The last thing I want to say, don't go to no college or trade school that you have not physically visited. Don't you dare choose a school off the brochure. You have to go. Tell your mothers and fathers, listen, mommy and daddy, I know you don't want to fly me to uh, Spelman or Morehouse. I know you don't want to fly me to Harvard or Princeton. I know you don't want to fly me to Norfolk State or Howard. I know you don't want to fly me to South Carolina State. I understand that. But if I don't get to see what this school is really like in person, and you pay $30,000 for my first year of college, and I get there and don't like it, you just lost $30,000 that you got to pay back. Flying to Atlanta might be a $500 ticket, but it's a whole lot cheaper than $30,000. Make sure you visit the school. Now, when you apply to college, they're going to want five things, college or trade school. Dr. Umar wants you to apply to at least 16 colleges. Four, eight, 12, 16, and I'm going to break them down. Four schools you're going to apply to are local, right here in Nevada. I don't want you to go to school in Nevada. I want you to get away from all the distractions in your life. Parents, siblings, boyfriends and girlfriends, I want you at least two hours away so you can focus. But the reason I want you to apply to four schools in Nevada is if you don't get accepted outside of Nevada, 
you can still get started on time. Four local schools. Then I want you to apply to four of your dream schools. These are the big schools that you always wanted to go to because you might get lucky and get a scholarship. And then I want you to apply to eight schools that are outside of the state of Nevada, but whose application requirements you meet. If they want a 3.5, you got a 3.5. If they want three credits of science, you got three credits of science. If they want one credit of a foreign language, you got one credit of a foreign language. Eight schools that you meet criteria for. Four schools in Nevada, four schools, your dream schools, and I'm gonna give you four more. I'm gonna give you four more for a total of 20. Your last four are going to be schools in the middle of nowhere. All white folks. Why do I want you to apply? Why does Dr. Umar want you to apply to schools that ain't got no black people on campus? You know why? Because it increases your chances of getting in and getting a full scholarship. Are y'all following me? Your child might not want to go to University of South Dakota. But if the University of South Dakota is giving them a full scholarship and a living stipend, your ass is going to go work with some cows and horses and shit. Do you understand? Because we don't want no loan debt. And I'm telling every black parent in here right now, you are out of your mind if your child gets a full scholarship and you let them turn it down because the school ain't cool enough. Let my daughter get a four-year scholarship to We Hate Black People University, Vermont. Her ass is gone. I might got to send a Black Panthers with her, but she's gone. Because if you're getting a full scholarship, me not turning that down. But I'm seeing children turn down full scholarship because I didn't want to go there. Excuse me? Do you know who got to pay this back when you done? Raise your hand if you owe student loans in here. Look at us. All of us owe student loans. I want y'all young people, I owe them too. I got six degrees, plenty of loans. I don't want y'all to be in that position. And this is what you're going to do not to be in that position. You're going to apply to college and trade schools as soon as they start accepting applications. Do not be on CP time. The worst thing your child can do when applying to college and trade school is send in an application at the deadline. That is bad. You know why that's bad? Scholarships are given early, not late. Scholarships go to the early boomers, not the late ones. How do you know, Dr. Umar? I used to work in an admissions office. Do you think they wait for 30,000 applications to decide who they're going to give the scholarships to? No. So a scholarship that should have been yours ends up being somebody else's because they was on time and you was late. Take the ACT and the SAT. Take the practice ACT and the practice SAT and see where you score and then retake it. You're going to need two letters of recommendation from your, college, your high school teachers. Make sure your children get three, not two. For all y'all who got children in high school, make sure they get three letters of recommendation, not two. You know why? One of them teachers ain't going to write a strong letter. One of them teachers is going to say something that don't look good on your child. So you need three so you can throw out the cool letter and still got two left. And if you're applying to 20 colleges, you need 21 letters. Why do you need 21 letters? Because you're going to open up the 21st letter to make sure you know what's in there. Don't you send no letter you ain't read. The worst thing you can do is send a letter you ain't read. Also, every college wants a what? Essay. They want an entrance essay, young people. And when you write your entrance essay, make sure somebody reads it. Get your English professor to read it. If your big brother can't read, he ain't got no business reading your essay. Make sure somebody can proofread. You know why? The college application process is a process of ruling you out, not in. If you misspell a word, your application is in the trash. If you don't know when to use a comma, your application is in the trash. If you don't know where to run on sentences, your application is in the trash. Get somebody to help you. And what should be in your letter? Number one, why do you want to go to that school? Number two, what do you want to study? Number three, how they know you're going to finish? And number four, desire to be successful.
I want to come to Millersville University to study psychology because you guys are ranked number 10 out of the top psychology undergraduate programs on the East Coast. You have two professors who have received awards for their research in child development, and I can't wait to come study under Mrs. Stauffenberg and on top. I don't care if you got to lie, make it look good. Research the professors and find the awards they got and put that in your letter. You want to be a, a lawyer and they got a big time lawyer? Put it in there. Mrs. Sausage Burger received the attorney of the year. I can't wait to study under such a distinguished professor. Listen, how you think I got into the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine? You think they wanted me in there? Hell no! But I know how to switch it up. When it was time to go for my interview, I found the tightest suit I could find. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, we're ready. <laughs> I wind it down the white folks. I'm like, oh my God, you know, and you already have your school psychologist study for I love white psychology. <laughs> Sigmund Freud, oh my God, have you read his Moses and Monotheism? <laughs> and then they made me go sit outside and they said, we gotta talk about your application. They call you back in and they say, congratulations, you've been accepted. You're the only black male. Oh my God, you will not regret this. Would you like a coffee or a latte? And then I was going along fine in my doctoral program until the cool professor, black woman, told the white folks who I really was. And she said, do you know who that is? And they said, who? Dr. Johnson? She said, no, you better go to YouTube and type his name in that mother. And, they, and YouTube and type that and saw a war against black boys and a homosexual agenda. They tried to kick me out the program. True story. Five year doctorate became eight because they did not want me to get my piece of paper. So I am living proof that you don't get your doctorate because you're smart. You get your doctorate because you're willing to co-sign the lies that the white establishment puts out. That's right. That's right. You could be dumb as a doorknob and get your doctorate if you are willing to co-sign the lies. And I wouldn't do it. So I damn near almost didn't finish. And thank God for my mentor, Dr. Leopold King, who's now an ancestor. If it wasn't for him being on my dissertation committee, I would have never got out of there. And I'm saying that to say this. This is my last thing for the young folks, and I want to close out with some questions. Don't go to college trying to change the world in college. Go to college to get your paperwork. Change the world when you get out. I did not graduate with honors from undergrad. And the reason I did is because I was trying to save the world in college. We went to the Million Man March, and we started this, and we fought against that, and I did all this good stuff, but I never got my honors. I wasn't supposed to be sacrificing academics for that. That stuff would be waiting for me when I finished. So make sure you get your paperwork. Everything else will come up later. And the last thing I'm gonna say to y'all, I better not catch you digging outside your race for any reason. I will call you a fool. I will find you and I will troll you. Black woman, you find you a good black man. Black man, you find you a good black woman. And if it ain't nothing in Nevada, go get her from college. There's a lot of good sisters in Compton. <laughs> and they can fight. See, when I get married, I don't want to marry no PhD black woman. Hell no, I don't want no PhD. I want me a regular sister from the hood. You know why? If I bring her some roses, it's the best thing in life. If I bring a doctor some roses, that's all you can get. A sister in the projects can make a damn omelet with some mushrooms and onions. No damn PhD cooking no omelet. 
PhD sisters can't fight. If I'm at a lecture, it's about to go down, and my sister from what? She gonna rumble with a man. <laughs> PhD will call the cops, oh my God. I think it's about to get violent. I don't want no damn coon. Give me a project, sister. All the skills and twice the courage. Brothers and sisters, as I bring this to a wrap, I want to say to my parents, we have to stop the special education of our children. It's not helping them. I want you to take out your phone right now because I'm going to give you my phone number. So if you ever need to reach me, you can call me or text me, Dr. Umar. I got a quick question. They want to evaluate my son, and it is now May the 14th, and school gets out. Good to see you, Queen. How do you see you right there? When does school get out in Las Vegas? When the last day? When is it? May 26th. So if you get a request to get your child evaluated on Monday, and school get out May 26th, your answer going to be no, and I'm going to tell you why. Never get your children evaluated the last two months of school. Really, last three. You know why? Your child's teacher is requesting the eval because she thinks he got a problem. He's in the third grade. She thinks he got a problem. But next year, he's going to be in the fourth grade with a new teacher, new classmates. He's going to be a little bit more mature, a little older. And the problem that this year teacher sees, next year teacher might not see. Never get your child evaluated at the end of the year. Wait till next year and give him or her an opportunity to show what they really can do. Are y'all following me? The other thing, when the school tell you to get your child put on medication, you're going to tell them no. And you're going to put it in a letter. And I have this letter in my book. If they keep harassing you, you can put a complaint with the state against that teacher or principal for practicing medicine without a license. It is illegal for a teacher to tell a parent your child need medicine. It's illegal for a teacher to tell a parent your child need medicine. So why we let these white folks tell us our children need drugs? See, at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, I have a solution for special ed and ADHD and emotional disturbance and intellectual disability. You know what it's going to be? I'm going to have an auditorium meeting with all my slow kids. If you on drugs or IEP, you got an emergency assembly. You know what I'm telling you? I'm going to say, all y'all in here, your parents think you slow. Y'all got reading problems and behavior problems and sit still problems and can't count problems. And since you need special help and we don't have special aid because we are a private school, not a public one, you come to school on Saturday and Sunday from 8 in the morning until 8 at night until your ass know how to count. And you're going to come to school Saturday and Sunday from 8 in the morning until 8 at night until your ass can sit still. And you're going to come to school on the weekend, Saturday morning and Sunday from 8 until, until you know how to count. Who in here would have bet me that after two weeks, after two weeks, I will have no ADHD problems? I don't have no reading problems. I don't have no math problems. You know why? Because your children are running a game on you. They can do it, but you're not making them do it. And when they come to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, I'm going to pull the genius out those babies. Listen, when I evaluate children, I often have to defend my conclusions. You know why? Because they have trouble believing that that child earned these scores. Let me tell you why children do better with Dr. Umar. Because I tell them the truth. When your child comes to my office, let's say he's in sixth grade, or your daughter's in sixth grade. I say, your mother thinks you're slow. Are you slow? No, I ain't nothing wrong with me. Your teacher thinks you're slow. Is your ass slow? <laughs> no, ain't nothing wrong with me. Well, guess what? I have a piece of paper. I want you to read it. Read that out loud. Permission to evaluate for special ed disability. Wait a minute, ain't that the cheese bus? Yeah. In this special class? Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> Do you think you belong on that bus? Ain't nothing wrong with me. Do you think you belong in that class? Ain't nothing wrong with me. Well, guess what, young man? There's only one person who decides that. You do. I'm about to give you an IQ test, 
and an achievement test, and an adaptive behavior test, and a behavior test, and an emotional test, and a visual motor test, and after you do all this work, I'm going to score it all up. And if you score high, you stay in the regular class. If you score low, you come to school on the cheese bus. It's totally up to you. That child is so damn motivated to stay off that cheese bus that guess what he ends up doing? Scoring at the 90th percentile. And then I bring the, the report to the principal and the parent, and they said, Dr. Umar, are you sure this is my son? You damn right it was your son. So can you explain to me how he scored so high with you, but he don't do it in the class? Sure. I gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. I know how to get the best out of our children. Oh, and I want y'all to know, we went fast at the Frederick Douglass Market Company. <laughs> I just want to make sure you know. I just want to, I got a red, black, and green paddle. Go ahead, you tighten up, grab him. Pat! Pop the dog. Pat! Matt Turner! Scream! Pat! Frederick Douglass! Oh, we want paddle. Oh, yeah, I want you to know. So if you got a problem with the paddle, don't send them to FDMG. Because we giving out paddles to me. Oh, yeah. And we got a special little RBG room, too. Because you know when the boys get to be 14 and 15, they be thinking they bigger than them? So guess what we do in the RBG room? I get all the brothers from the community, right? And we turn the lights off. And we put them in the RBG room. And we remind them what it means to be a real man. And then when they come out, they nice and humble with you. Oh, yes! Heaven on earth, we ain't going to have no problem. Every class is going to have a classroom dinner once a month. There's a long day at school. They put their suit and tie on. Not because we're European, but I want them to know how to play the game so they can win. And they're going to sit down at the table, and they're going to know how to use this fork, and when to use that fork, and when to use this phone, and when to use this phone. Now, I'm going to make sure they understand. We don't give a damn about none of this. Europeans are neurotic. They are so bestial and Neanderthal-like and caveman that they need three forks and two spoons and three cups and shit. <laughs> Because they're trying to hide all that animal inside. Do you understand me? See, he's got to be ultra sophisticated because he's really a damn lizard. So he got to overdo everything. A coffee cup, a juice cup, a water cup. I don't need all this shit. Just give me the pot. I'll drink out the pot. <laughs> I remember one time I was at a dinner. I was speaking at the keynote. I used the same fork for the silent. And the white one was like, Dr. Trump. Listen here, you damn cave dweller. I'm not neurotic about my humanity. I know who I am. One fork is fine. Would you like the others? Maybe you got some Negroes you need to stick later. You want a fork? <laughs> the white man is neurotic because he's always trying to cover up his animalistic and bestial and inhumane tendencies. That's why he got to overdress and overact and overeat and overwalk and over this. You gotta sit like this and sit for what? Because I'm really a damn cave dweller. And I gotta overdo everything I do to look ultra sophisticated because I don't want nobody to catch words that I'm really something I'm not claiming to be. So we're gonna have the family dinner, and then we're gonna have the fireside chat with Dr. Uma when I'm gonna teach them stories from our ancestors. Sit around the fire and learn the map turn. Sit around the fire and learn how it comes. And then we're going to take them fishing once a month, camping once a month. And we're going to have the Frederick Douglass Market Garvey Jr. Gun Club. And your son will his first firearm from the school. His own first baby yak. <laughs> but we're going to teach him to be responsible with his thing. But he's going to learn how to defend his mama and his big sister and his little sister when his daddy ain't in the house. We are trying to reinvent African masculinity one black boy at a time. As I heard, I want to give you a quote from my ancestor, Frederick Douglass, who said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and deprecate agitation fall of its waters. Frederick Douglass said, for 20 years, I prayed on my knees to God for freedom. But the good Lord gave me no freedom until I got up off my knees and prayed with my feet. Frederick Douglass said, a man who will not fight for his own freedom when he has the means of doing so isn't worth being fought for by others. He said, if a man won't stand, leave him on the ground. 
Because if you make him stand and he ain't ready to stand, you're going to crash back on his face, leave him there till he's ready to stand up and be a man. He said, power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. The first of my fraternal ancestors brought to America was a black man named Bailey, stolen most likely from Nigeria, sold into slavery in Maryland, 1701. He married Grandma Selah, for whom my nine-year-old daughter is named. She'll be 10 next month. And they had Grandma Jenny in 1745. And in 1774, they gave birth to Grandma Betsy. Grandma Betsy married a free black man, Grandpa Isaac. They had 12 children. One daughter was named Harriet. Another daughter, my five times great grandmother, was named Betsy after her mother. These two sisters were raped by the white men who owned our family. And so in February of 1818, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was born. At the age of 20, he would run away and change his name from Fred Bailey to Fred Douglas. The next year in 1819, my grandmother, young Betsy, gave birth to his half brother and first cousin, Stephen Henry Bailey. If you ever read narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, he talks about cousin Stephen. Growing up with cousin Stephen, that's my four times great grandfather, Stephen Henry Bailey. I visit his grave every year in Maryland. The Civil War starts. Frederick doesn't fight, but he sends two of his sons, Lewis and Charles, they go north to Boston. They enroll in the Boston, Massachusetts 54th Colored Regiment, from which we get the movie Glory. My grandfather Stephen married my grandma Caroline. They had grandfather George. November the 14th of 1841, 10 years after Nat Turner, Grandpa George and Grandpa Stephen, father and son, fight in the United States Colored Troops of Maryland, the 9th and the 19th Regiment, respectively. My two grandfathers was at Appomattox when General Lee surrendered. Stop letting these teachers tell black kids that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. No! The slaves freed Abraham Lincoln! We freed him! After the war, Grandpa George becomes the first black public school teacher in Denton, Maryland, hometown of Harriet Tubman's parents. He marries Grandma Annie, the, ne the niece of Bishop Alexander Wayman the seventh bishop of the AME Church, who gave William Still the Underground Railroad office in Philadelphia. And then Grandpa George and Grandma Annie had Grandma Caroline. Grandma Caroline moved to Philadelphia with her big sister. She had Grandma Vivian. Grandma Vivian marries a Spanish-speaking Cuban immigrant from Havana, Grandpa Cicero. And they have Grandma Ida, who passed away two years ago. And she meets and marries James Johnson. And they have Jamal. And he meets Barbara. And on August the 21st, the anniversary of the Nat Turner War and the Haitian Revolution and the Fugitive Slave Convention and the George Jackson War, Umar Johnson is born in North Philadelphia. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, religion is okay, but knowledge itself is better. The most honorable Marcus Garvey said, without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life, but with confidence you have won even before you have started. Take down my phone number, 215-989-9858. I repeat, 215-989-9858. Once more, 215-989-9858. That's how you can text me. I think that's the FBI trying to get in. <laughs> Now, I do want to tell y'all, once the school is open next year, right, we want to open it this year, but once we start school for the boys next year, August of 2022, I'm going to have to change my number because y'all be texting me all day when I'm trying to educate the babies, okay? I want to tell you a story and then we're done. And the story is about Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver. Booker T. Washington was born a slave in West Virginia. He walked to Hampton, Virginia, because he wanted to get an education. When he got to Hampton, he could not afford to pay for the education. So he asked for an opportunity to work himself through college, which he won. After he graduated from Hampton, the principal, who was a white man, got a phone call from 
Tuskegee, Alabama, asking for a black Negro educator who could come down here and teach black people how to survive in this impoverished but highly racist city. Booker T took it. When he got to Hampton, there was no school. He had to use an old church or old barn. And when the first class of students came to Tuskegee Institute, which started school on July the 4th, they dug up the ground with their own hands. They made their own clothes. They cooked their own food. They built their own buildings. The students did this. Remember, it was Booker T who inspired the Honorable Marcus Garvey to start the largest black movement of all time. And then Booker T said, I need a science teacher. He heard of a black man also born in slavery, castrated as a child because white folks thought he might want to have relations with their little daughter, so they took off his reproductive. That's why George Washington Carver never had children and had a high-pitched voice. George Washington Carver was considered the top scientist in America, not black, but period. He was being offered lucrative contracts to go and work for military industrial corporations. He turned it down. He went to Tuskegee. And when he got there, he said, Booker T, where's my office? Where's my apartment? Where's my science lab? And Booker T said, George, all we have is what you see. And so George Washington Carver went to the trash and he took out paper, aluminum, copper, tin, metal. And from the garbage of college students, he gave us more than 300 products from the peanuts. From the garbage of college students, he gave us more than 200 products from the sweet potato. From the garbage of college students, he gave us hundreds of products from the soybean. I got one question. How is it we came from ancestors who had nothing and did everything, and yet we got everything and did nothing? I think Queen Mother Harriet Tubman had the answer when she said, I freed hundreds of slaves. I could have freed thousands, but the problem was they didn't even know that they were slaves. Black Power, Las Vegas, I love you. Dr. Umar Johnson. We now going to do, we now going to do, I appreciate y'all. Sister Frida, where you at? So I know where you at. We're going to take 10 questions. Once we're done with the 10 questions, how many vendors we got in here today? Just one and two. Is it just one plus me, two plus me? We got more. How many over there? We got two. And we got two. Tell me what you're selling real quick. My queen sitting down. Traditional African waste beads. What else? Spiritual tools. You got me coon go away cream. Working on the coon go away. Black man, what you got? Say again. Custom apparel. Over here, what we got? Middle school entrepreneurship training school to teach them how to go into business in middle school. I love it. Who else we got? Is that someone else there? Got some t-shirts as well. What we got? You got some cards. How can they reach you? Why you ain't got no cards in the Dr. Umar lecture? I'm picking with you. I got you. Okay. What's the web website? I want in. I want in musicgroup.com. I want in musicgroup.com for all of y'all who got babies who want to do music. Am I missing anybody? Any other vendor? Yes. CMOS Jail, you got some here? Uh, How can they reach you for the CMOS Jail? He got business cards on the money. What we got, Bob? <laughs> What's the name of it again? Indie, Indie Evolution Online Radio. Powerful. So we got the brother there, Queen, with the hand. CPR, y'all need to learn CPR. If somebody starts choking, you gotta know how to save them. We need that CPR, and let me say this to you, Queen. CPR Queen, you need to text message me because we're going to do CPR for all the staff and faculty at SDMG. 
and we may contract with you to fly on out and teach. Am I right? So you make sure you do that. All right? Talk to me. Urban Star Media, is that radio or what are we doing with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Powerful. We got a lot of been Who else in here? Talk to me. Yes, sir. We got Cool Breeze Promotions. Uh, it's an amateur female and young adults uh, women's boxing. If you want to support. Did I hear young sisters boxing? Did y'all hear that? It's powerful. I never heard of that before. We need that. Young sisters boxing. Instead of sitting around doing their damn nails, eating all day. Get them up. Let them go punch some damn body and learn self defense. That's powerful, then. We might need you to come to FDMG and do a little boxing with the queen. You know what I'm saying? They, they use headgear, right? Because if you knock a tooth out of a sister, they mother coming for you. Let me tell you right now. You can't have a toothless princess. Paul, how do they reach you? Uh, if you want to donate, we do have a GoFundMe. It's GoFundMe slash DFD6DC29. You know damn well. They not gonna remember all them bitches. Any, any business cards? Any business cards or website? So you can definitely just check out the information. Okay, wait, where the cards at? Where the cards at? You mentioned cards. Cards are back there. Back there on the table with Sister Free. So when y'all go get my book, get the cards. You, our daughters do need to learn how to box. So they might gotta knock some crap about. Yeah. Uh, we do have uh, WKRN, uh, which stands for Worldwide Kids Shop uh, Radio uh, Network here in Los Angeles. So is that children doing the radio? Uh, no. It, it has, it's working. It's, it's working towards that, I got you. But its main goal is to uh, present socially uh, aware, conscious music. Conscious music. So you definitely check that out. Uh, you don't want to miss it, share it. And then also there's flyers in the back too. Powerful, powerful. And then one more, well, I'm sorry, one more thing. You get to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> if you want to check out my, my, uh, my podcast, Agent X Maya, through Anchor, you can definitely check that out. Just type me in, Agent X Maya. I talk about politics, spirituality, and I even do, uh, interview Dr. Umar, so you can definitely catch our interview as well. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, that's it. Indeed, indeed. Let me go with the brother in the white. Talk to me, brother. I'm a, I'm a casting director. Casting director. Yeah. So you mean like with motion picture type stuff? Or? Yeah, I put people in like the NWA movie. Get out of here. You put people in the NWA movie. Yeah. Why was not I in the NWA movie? I actually, um, I, I was working my head because I... What's your next movie you working on? We're doing a movie with LeBron James and Adam Sandler. It's called Hustle for the City in Okay. I wanted to invite you up tonight. In Newark, New Jersey. Oh, here y'all got a community dance for the kids tonight. What's the address and what's the time? Thirty twenty North Walnut. What's the time? Till when? Five thirty till. Six to nine, what's the ages? It's kids, high school. I'm just one of the owners. I just came down from my son's house. Gotcha. But what's the ages, though? Because you can't have six year olds with 16 year olds. Yeah, 16 years old. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, but what I'm. The therapist in me, the 16 year old dance can't have six year Like, is it going to be split? Are you saying the six-year-olds are dancing with the 15 and 14 and 16? The community is this, it's a gym. Okay. So, so like a family thing. Instead of being in the park, they're in the park. Age range. Right, it's just the age range is a little, you follow me? You gotta demark that because a 16-year-old is too old so to be. <laughs> okay, no problem, that's powerful. Let's work it out when we get over here. We got some chaperones. Okay. Some of our kids ain't right in the head, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Okay, powerful. Let me get another sister. Did I skip? Talk to me, beautiful. Castle House Conglomerate. Yeah. And um, it's a showgirl company. Currently, it's about 12 Caucasian showgirl companies and two black owned. We're one of the two black owned. So if you guys know anyone that's into modeling or want to get promoted, we definitely invest in them and mm. help.
Okay. Y'all heard that right? Showgirls, models, handle that. What size y'all looking for? Do they got to be extra skinny like the white girl models? No. So they can be voluptuous. Natural. You gotta have wigs, you know. We're the only uh, company like to wear your natural hair. Ah, I love that system. You can be natural, all right. I'm loving that. Powerful. Let's do a few more. Queen. I'm a proud patient. Ah. So I can go to Africa. You need to, I need you to look into a package, a group trip to Jamaica for me. You feel me? As soon as you got something for me, let me know. Because I, I want to, I do Africa. We ain't going to stop doing Africa. Possibly this summer. Yeah. I want to hit some of that Caribbean island. Do Jamaica, do the Grenadines, do the uh, US Virgin Islands. I want to hit up a couple. So, Well, not this year. We're going to postpone because of all the COVID stuff. But let me know what you find on there. Because I'm ready for that. Talk to the king. Speak on up. You buy property with all cash, so you pay people straight cash for their property. Gotcha. So you even help them if they want to save the house that they have. Y'all try to help. Okay, okay. So they need help with that with that mortgage. I heard they got y'all out here in Vegas on that 100-year Emancipation Proclamation mortgage. Okay, don't be buying no house for 50 years. That's not buying. That's leasing. Queen in the back with the pink. Talk to me. Uh-huh. Speak a little louder. Yes. What are y'all doing at the... Oh, y'all sell cars. Do y'all have a lot or... Do y'all have a lot? Okay, how can people find out about the cars you have for sale? Okay, do you got any cars? We got to start having business cars. Y'all notice that? Because all y'all got some powerful services. We got to start carrying them cars. Your website is something real quick. They can come to you, but... Is there a website or Instagram page or ground, like the ground, groundauto.com. That's real simple to remember, y'all, groundauto.com. Queen. Powerful. It should be, well, if it's trick, it depends. Because if you want to be an engineer, doctor, psychologist, you got to go back and get that doctorate. So for a lot of them, it's straight to grad school. For others, it should be entrepreneurial shit. Powerful. Oh man, congratulations. No white girl. No white girl, right? All right, all right. Powerful. We might need to resume for SDMG, brother. Yeah, we might need that. Tomorrow, you know. 
Yeah, for those of y'all who don't know, I'm in Oakland tomorrow, 2100 Fifth Avenue, the Church of All Faiths, 2 to 8, Oakland, and then L.A. on Sunday, 2 to 8, at Blessed Love Community uh, Center, 1404 Vernon Ave in L.A. on Sunday, Oakland tomorrow. If you need it, text me. You got my number. I'll send you the flyer for Oakland, L.A. And then next Saturday, the 22nd, Palm Springs for their Unity Day from 11 to 4 in Palm Springs, College. Let's link. Let's link on up. Queen. Costume? Okay, because we still look for somebody to design the uniforms for the Frederick Bellas Marcus Garvey Academy. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. But finish though. What else you design? Show me. Okay. Is it unisex or just women or? Did you bring me one, 2XL? Not extra medium. I'll bleed in the underarm. <laughs> Okay, you got a semi sense like a wear it when I'm live on you know Instagram so people get familiar with you. All right, King. Ah. Powerful. Powerful, Sister Stacy. And give a heart to Brother Curtis for putting this together, Sister Stacy, the whole team who made it possible for Dr. Umar to come. This is what I want to do, because we got books to sign. I'm going to limit the questions to five, but I do have an announcement of my own. I will be coming back to Vegas in either, in either October or November, five or six months' time, to offer my Nevada State Black Parent Know Your School Rights Boot Camp Training. Okay? It's going to be from 8 in the morning to 8 at night. It's going to be everything in the book you're going to buy and more. Every parent needs to be there. We may even do it right here because there's enough space in here to do that. But just keep in mind that I will be back. And for parents who want to get trained on how to be an expert advocate in the schools, you need to be here. But I want to warn you, if you register, you must be in your seat and accounted for by 10 a.m. If you come in after 10, you won't get in because you would have already missed too much information. We're going to provide you with a continental breakfast. We're going to provide you with lunch. Okay? And we're going to have fun and we're going to learn. It is intensive, so I recommend you don't bring young children. If you have to, no problem but we recommend you get a babysitter because there's so much information, you need to focus on what I'm teaching you. You're gonna get a thick packet of information. We got some people here who've taken the train. Queen Head took it, Tiffany Lois, there's other folks who have taken the train. We also have a signing sheet. Thank you, Sister Frida. Make sure y'all go to Sister Frida to get my book and also sign up. If you put your info on that, phone number and email, I will add you to a group list and you will know exactly when that date is for the training when Dr. Umar is coming back to you to sign up. Black Power? Yeah. Let me take five questions and then we're going to start signing books. Brother, you number one. Sister, you number two. Lois is three. Brother, you four. And the last one got to be a queen. Five. Who my number one? I will repeat the question. Yes, sir. Salute. Salute. At what age? At what age can you teach your children how to use a gun? I would say there is no minimum. It will be based on the maturity of the child. And just so y'all know, most states allow children to handle firearms as long as they are under the supervision of an adult. I live in Pennsylvania. To my knowledge, Pennsylvania doesn't have a minimum limit. Okay? As long as they are supervised. Does anybody know about Nevada? between six and eight, but it's relatively young, as long as they're under the supervision of a parent. So I would say as soon as you're ready to teach them, teach them the safety first, okay? And make sure you keep them guns locked up and away from the children, preferably in a safe, okay? We're probably gonna train with fake guns before we ever take them to the range. Good question. Who's my number two? Was you two? No, you wasn't, because you started still another. <laughs> Who am I two? Queen in the pink. Go ahead, Queen. Were you number two? You sure? Is she still a number? 
You know what, listen. Y'all wanna hear something? I've been speaking for 30 years. I've never done a Q&A in the world. No way, not Africa, not Europe, not Asia, not the Caribbean, where Negroes can remember their numbers. So I don't know what it is with us. No way, I'm telling you, I have never done a Q&A where we can remember our numbers. But go ahead, Queen. Uh huh. Because you gave them permission. Remember, we can't test unless y'all sign that paper. It's okay. Uh-huh. It's okay. Developmental delay. Brother, I needed that all. <laughs> uh huh. It's all right, it's all right. We family in here. We don't apologize when you're around family. It's okay, it's okay. sitting in here with baby mama issues and baby daddy issues and fighting amongst ourselves in our community. What my organization does, and because I am a student of Dr. Umar Johnson, the black family is all that we have. And we have to learn how to resolve our own disputes. Yes. And so I offer to the family to have a space safe to speak and talk about whatever your concerns are. Mm. Child support, visitation, even if you're getting divorced, that doesn't have to be in, in the court. We That's always right. go to our oppressor to solve our disputes. We are learning how to be a village. We are learning how to support one another. And our words have to be bond between us. When we lay down and we made our children and created them, that didn't go away we still have to have that same authority over our children and over our families. So you can reach me at blackfamilymediation.com. I'm also on you Instagram. Got cards? Excuse me? Cards. Card. Yes, and I have cards with me. Blackfamilymediation.com, but you also got some cards. I also have cards. All right, y'all need that. 
Help that family mediate, y'all. Who's my number four? Right here. Go ahead, Bob. How you doing, sir? All right. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inspiring a lot of, uh, a lot of people that I know, and I came here specifically today. I drove from California. Uh, my name is Major Williams. I'm running for governor of California. Uh, I came out here for all my family. My question is, you know, uh, from watching you, and I know that you have a psychology background, for a young person like him, what are two books that you would prefer someone like him to read now? Look at the age. He's 10. And he, know, and he knows how to shoot. Wow. Uh, <laughs> for me, the young children can handle books that we often think they can't. I wouldn't mind letting him take a stab at Miseducation of the Negro, Cardi B. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't mind him taking a stab at Stolen Legacy, George yes. G.M. James. Yes. Those are two. But what I also like for the young kids, the autobiographies are a good introduction to conscious literature. So for those of you with elementary and middle school students, autobiographies of Frederick Douglass, of Harry Tubman, of Sojourner Truth. Are y'all following me? Of Ivan B. Wells. A good intro for the babies is the autobiographies, because they get history, they get culture, they get story, they get struggle, they get narrative, they get character, they get integrity. I love the autobiographies for the babies as a good intro. Absolutely. Appreciate it. No problem, brother. Where you at in college? Um, Pasadena. Ooh. All right. Are you close to Palm Springs or to LA? LA. LA, but I'm close. My office is in Marietta, so I'm close to Palm Springs. Okay, because I'm there. I'm, I'm in L.A. Sunday, this Sunday, the day okay. after tomorrow, and I'm in Palm Springs next Saturday. Make sure you and connect. Oakland tomorrow. Yes, sir. Did you take my name? Yeah, I did. Okay, let's get back to him now. Are you running independent? No, I'm a Republican. That ain't necessarily a bad thing. It all depends on the strategy. Absolutely. Right. Okay, you ain't got a white woman now. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Queens, are you five or are you still in the number? Who my five? The real five. That was up. Go ahead, Queen. For me, we have to be Pan African. We have to be pragmatic and we have to be political about everything. Let's take the political. Everything's political. Every commercial, every joke, every news story, every, every, every movie you watch, there's political messages all in it. Everything is political. The problem with black folks is we think certain things are not political, like church. We swear church ain't political. Church is the most political institution in the black community because it is more responsible for the black lack of mobility than any other because the church teaches us that God will change things when God is ready. That is the perfect prescription for us to sit still and do nothing about our own reality. Everything is political. Gangster rap is political. The Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, and Megan Thee Stallion, the, the WAP video, everything's political the sexual objectification of the woman's body. Everything's political. And you have to look at everything and say, what is the political message in this? All content has intent. Next, we have to be Pan-African. Whatever they do to Africans anywhere in the world, they do to Africans everywhere in the world. The reason black America hasn't made more progress is we will not tie our struggles to the struggles on the continent. We can only go as far as Africa goes. The reason Joe Biden is giving the Asians all of this individual attention is because China can put sanctions on America. China can put consequences on America. Chinese Americans have a nation that speaks out for them. Indian Americans have a nation that speaks out for them. Jewish Americans, everybody got a nation somewhere else that speaks out but us. We have to build that with Africa, but if we want African nations to speak up for us, we have to do for them. That's why we gotta organize some of this two trillion so we can invest it in the mother continent so the mother continent gets stronger to invest in us. Some of y'all think Pan-Africanism. Some of y'all think Pan-Africanism means that 
we all go back to Africa. No, it doesn't. You have a future outside of Africa, but you have no future without Africa. Make her strong so we can be stronger. It's just that simple. A people without a national homeland are naked and defenseless. We need Africa, and Africa needs us. In fact, there was a security memorandum that was put out by, it might have been the big new Brzezinski in the 70s. He said the greatest threat to American foreign interests is a serious political and economic relationship between Africans in Africa and Africans in America. The government said this is the greatest threat. That's why they want to keep us apart. Brothers and sisters, don't get turned off by a couple coons from Africa. Africa got coons just like black America got coons. Yes, there are African coons. There are. But you don't let a few bad apples spoil the destiny of an entire race. You don't need nobody's permission to be African. When I go to Africa, I don't ask permission to be there. This is mine as much as it is yours. Pan-Africanism didn't come from Africa. It came from us in the States, and we took it there. And it's important that we understand that. And then when I say we have to be pragmatic, you know what I'm saying? We have to ask the question with everything that's put in front of us. How does this? benefit African people. Homosexuality. How does this benefit African people? Transgenderism, men becoming women. How does that benefit black boys still growing up to be men? The black church isn't beneficial. Everything you bring, Dr. Umar, you can probably answer the question for me by asking yourself, how does this benefit black people? Gangster rap. How does that benefit black people? It don't. The reality shows. How does that benefit black people? Married white girls. How does that benefit black people? You have to be pragmatic. Pragmatism means we only deal with that which is essential for our progress. If it is not progressive, it is not for us. Nothing is neutral. It either has a plus or a minus. The entire world that we live in is binary. The entire world we live in is X's and O's. Everything. There is no neutral in a binary world. You have the sun for the moon. You have land for water. You have a positive charge for a negative charge. You have the man for the woman. Everything is binary. Nothing is neutral. You either feminine or you masculine. That's it. Last one, queen. There are exceptions. There are exceptions. I will give you that. I know some exceptions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's what I want to say to clarify, and I want you to hear me well, and I don't disagree with nothing you said. There are black people who can say everything you just said, but say a white person did it for them. No, stay with me. That doesn't mean white people aren't racist because there was a white person who helped you. The fact that a church benefited you, and I'm glad that church did, and I give them respect, right, but stay with what I'm saying here. Just because that church benefited you, and there's churches that have benefited other people here, doesn't mean that that church is systemically doing things to make life better for black people. We have to make sure we don't confuse the good that is done for individuals for a greater good that is done for the community. Because one thing that the black boot, and I'm not speaking of your church queen, 
but I'm speaking generally. But one thing that the black bourgeoisie is very skilled in doing is making sure they have a good story to tell of how I helped him get off drugs and her get a house and him start a business. But when I ask them, what have you done systemically to address mass incarceration, miseducation, gentrification, police brutality, and access to wealth, they're often quiet with the answer because they don't have it. I'm not discounting none of that, but I'm saying we need the black church to be of systemic benefit to black people as a collective and not as an individual. You, you follow me? Yes, that's all we think. That's all we think. Cut it out. You will get the last word. Go ahead, beautiful. Doctor Ted. She said she knew that we supposed to ask the question. She knew that we supposed to ask the question. I remember that. And I was like, wow, because I started crying when she was taking the video. But I want to know with it. Um, I'm a vocal realtor for the very long state of Nevada. And I started the nonprofit organization about a month ago. Okay. And um, as far as the housing property. Oh, wow. Peace and salutations to everybody. I hope that you guys really enjoyed this event. Um, we're gonna have to cut it short uh, because my phone is dying. So I appreciate everybody that tuned in. I'm also gonna post this on my YouTube channel as well. So you can definitely go check it out uh, on my YouTube page, Adrian X Myot. Check me out on Adrian X Myot through Anchor. Uh, through um, Google Cast, through Spotify, uh, through multiple platforms I'm doing. I have my, uh, my program set up so you can definitely go check it out. And also if you want to donate to me, you can uh, do uh, donate to my cash app, dollar sign ADD 1989. And if you want to uh, donate to the Black Panther Party as well, you can donate to them as well for the Las Vegas chapter. Uh, it's the dollar sign uh, people 702. Again, that's dollar sign people 702. And uh, we want to thank everybody that tuned in again. I want to reemphasize that without y'all, this wouldn't be possible. We also have the, uh, the celebration event with Malcolm X vending vibes. So if you're out here in Vegas, make sure you come out. Uh, to support that event, you can donate. Uh, you can come here. Uh, it's, it's family uh, friendly. We're going to have poets speaking. We're going to have comedians here. And we're going to have hip hop artists uh, performing as well. So definitely come and check it out. You don't want to miss it. And um, again, salute to everybody that uh, tuned in. It is more to come. Uhuru, uh, Subek Ankma, and uh, Ubuntu. Salute.